Chapter Two of Hunter Patrol by H. Beam Piper and John McGuire. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two. Oh no, Gregory told him earnestly. The government isn't a theocracy, at least not yet. But if the guide keeps on insisting that only beautiful things are good, and that he is uniquely qualified to define beauty. Watch his rule change into just that. I've been detecting symptoms of religious paranoia, messianic delusions about his public statements, the woman began. Idolatry, another member of the group, who wore a black coat fastened to the neck and white neckbands rasped. Idolatry indeed as well as in spirit. The sense of unreality, partially dispelled, began to return. Benson dropped to the floor and stood beside the table, getting a cigarette out of his pocket and lighting it. I made a joke, he said, putting his lighter away. The fact that none of you got it has done more to prove that I am fifty years in the future than anything any of you could say. He went on to explain who the St. Louis Cardinals were. Yes, I remember. Baseball, Anthony exclaimed. There is no baseball now. The guide will not allow competitive sports. He says that they foster the spirit of violence. The cadaverous man in the blue jacket turned to the man in the black garment of similar cut. You probably know more history than any of us, he said, getting a cigar out of his pocket and lighting it. He lighted it by rubbing the end on the sole of his shoe. Suppose you tell him what the score is. He turned to Benson. You can rely on his dates and happenings. His interpretation's strictly capitalist, of course, he said. Black Jacket shook his head. You first, Gregory, he said. Tell him how he got here, and then I'll tell him why. I believe, Gregory began, that in your period fiction writers made some use of the subject of time travel. It was not, however, given serious consideration largely because of certain alleged paradoxes involved, and because of an elementalist and objectifying attitude toward the whole subject of time. I won't go into the mathematics and symbolic logic involved, but we have disposed of the objections. More, we have succeeded in constructing a time machine, if you want to call it that. We prefer to call it a temporal spatial displacement field generator. It's really very simple. The woman called Paula interrupted. If the universe is expanding, time is a widening spiral. If contracting, a diminishing spiral. If static, a uniform spiral. The possibility of pulsation was our only worry. That's no worry, Gregory reproved her. I show you that the rate was too slow to have an effect on— Oh, nonsense! You can measure something which exists within a microsecond. But where is the instrument to measure a temporal pulsation that may require years? You haven't come to that yet. Be quiet, both of you, the man with the black coat and the white bands commanded. While you argue about vanities, thousands are being converted to the godlessness of the guide, and other thousands of his dupes are dying unprepared to face their maker. All right, you invented a time machine, Benson said. In civvies I was only a high school chemistry teacher. I can tell a class of juniors the difference between H2O and H2SO4, but the theory of time travel is wasted on me. Suppose you just let me ask the questions. Then I'll be sure of finding out what I don't know. For instance, who won the war I was fighting in before you grabbed me and brought me here? The commies? No, the United Nations, Anthony told him. At least they were the least exhausted when both sides decided to quit. Then what's this dictatorship, the guide, extreme rightist? Walter, you'd better tell him, Gregory said. We damn near lost the war, the man in the black jacket and striped trousers said. But for once we won the peace. The Soviet bloc was broken up. India, China, Indonesia, Mongolia, Russia, the Ukraine, all the satellite states, most of them turned into little dictatorships like the Latin American countries after the liberation from Spain, but they were personal, non-ideological, generally benevolent dictatorships. 
the kind that can grow into democracies if they're given time. Capitalist dictatorships, he means, the cadaverous man in the blue jacket explained. Be quiet, Carl, Anthony told him. Let's not confuse this with any class struggle stuff. Actually, the United Nations rules the world, Walter continued. What goes on in the Ukraine or Latvia or Manchuria is about analogous to what went on under the old United States government in, let's say, Tammany-ruled New York. But here's the catch. The UN is ruled absolutely by one man. How could that happen? In my time, the UN had its functions so subdivided and compartmented that it couldn't even run a war properly. Our army commanders were making war by systematic disobedience. The charter was changed shortly after, uh, that is, after— Walter was fumbling for words. After my death? Benson finished politely. Go on. Even with the changed charter, how did one man get all the power into his hands? By sorcery, black coat and white bands fairly shouted, by the help of his master Satan. You know, there are times when some such theory tempts me, Paula said. He was a big money-bags, Carl said. He bribed his way in. See, New York was bomb flat. Where the old UN buildings were, it's still hot. So the guide donated a big tract of land outside St. Louis, built these buildings. We're in the basement of one of them right now, if you want a good laugh. And before long, he had the whole organization eating out of his hand. They just voted him into power, and the world into slavery. Benson looked around at the others, who were nodding in varying degrees of agreement. Substantially, that's it. He managed to convince everybody of his altruism, integrity, and wisdom, Walter said. It was almost blasphemous to say anything against him. I really don't understand how it happened. Well, what's he been doing with his power? Benson asked. Wise things are stupid ones. I could be general and say that he has deprived all of us of our political and other liberties. It's best to be specific, Anthony said. Gregory? My own field, dimensional physics, hasn't been interfered with much yet. It's different in other fields. For instance, all research in sonics has been arbitrarily stopped. So has a great deal of work in organic and synthetic chemistry. Psychology is a madhouse of, uh, what was the old word, licentiousness? No, lysenconism. Medicine and surgery, well, there's a huge program of compulsory sterilization and another one of eugenic marriage control, and infants who don't conform to certain physical standards don't survive. Neither do people who have disfiguring accidents beyond the power of plastic surgery. Paula spoke next. My field is child welfare. Well, I'm going to show you an audio-visual of an interesting ceremony in a Hindu village, derived from the ancient custom of the Sati. It is the Hindu method of conforming to the guide's demand that only beautiful children be allowed to grow to maturity. The film was mercifully brief. Even in spite of the drums and gongs and the chanting of the crowd, Benson found out how loudly a newborn infant can scream in a fire. The others looked as though they were going to be sick. He doubted if he looked much better. Of course, we are a more practical and mechanical-minded people here and in Europe, Paula added, holding down her gorge by main strength. We have lethal gas chambers that even Hitler would have envied. I am a musician, Anthony said, a composer. If Gregory thinks that the sciences are controlled, he should try to write even the simplest piece of music. The extent of censorship and control over all the arts, and especially music, is incredible. He coughed slightly. And I have another motive, a more selfish one. I am approaching the compulsory retirement age. I will soon be invited to go to one of the havens. Even though these havens are located in the most barren places, they are beauty spots, verdant beyond belief. It is of only passing interest that while large numbers of the age to go there yearly, their populations remain constant and to judge from the quantities of supply shipped to them, extremely small. 
They call me Samuel in this organization, the man in the long black coat said. Whoever gave me that alias must have chosen it, because I am here in an effort to live up to it. Although I am ordained by no church, I fight for all of them. The plain fact is that this man we call the Guide is really the Antichrist. Well, I haven't quite so lofty a motive, but it's good enough to make me willing to finance this project, Walter said. It's very simple. The Guide won't let people make money, and if they do he taxes it away from them, and he has laws to prohibit inheritance. What little you can accumulate you can't pass on to your children. I put up a lot of money, too, don't forget, Carl told him. Or the Union did. I'm a poor man myself. He was smoking an excellent cigar for a poor man, and his clothes could have come from the same tailor as Walter's. Look, we got a real Union, the Union of all Unions. Every working man in North America, Europe, Australia, and South Africa belongs to it. And the guide has us all hog-tied. He won't let you strike, Benson chuckled. That's right. And what can we do? Why, we can't even make our clothes shop contracts stick. And as far as getting anything like a pay raise. Good thing. Another pay raise in some of my companies would bankrupt them, the way the guide has us under his thumb. Walter began, but he was cut off. Well, it seems as though this guide has done some good. If he's made you two realize that you're both on the same side, and that what hurts one hurts both, Benson said. When I shipped out for Turkey in 77, neither labor nor management had learned that. He looked from one to another of them. The guide must have a really good bodyguard with all the enemies he's made. Gregory shook his head. He lives virtually alone, in a very small house on the U.N. Capitol grounds. In fact, except for a small police force, armed only with non-lethal stun-guns, your profession of arms is non-existent." "'I've been guessing what you want me to do,' Benson said. "'You want this guide bumped off. But why can't any of you do it? Or if it's too risky, at least somebody from your own time? Why me?' "'We can't. Everybody in the world today is conditioned against violence. Especially the taking of human life, Anthony told him. Now wait a moment. This time he was using the voice he would have employed in chiding a couple of Anatolian peasant partisans who were field-stripping a machine gun the wrong way. Those babies in that film you showed me weren't dying of old age. That is not violence, Paula said bitterly. That is humane beneficence. Ugly people would be unhappy and would make others unhappy in a world where everybody else is beautiful." "'And all these oppressive and tyrannical laws,' Benson continued, "'how does he enforce them without violence actual or threatened?' Samuel started to say something about the power of the evil one. Paula, ignoring him, said, "'I really don't know. He just does it. Mass hypnotism of some sort. I know music has something to do with it because there is always music everywhere. This laboratory, for instance, was secretly soundproofed. We couldn't have worked here otherwise." "'All right. I can see that you'd need somebody from the past, preferably a soldier, whose conditioning had been in favor rather than against violence. I'm not the only one you snatched, I take it?' "'No. We've been using that machine to pick up men from battlefields all over the world and all over history,' Gregory said. Until now, none of them could adjust. Oh, he shuddered, looking even sicker than when the film was being shown. He's thinking, Walter said, about a French officer from Waterloo who blew out his brains with a pocket pistol on that table, and an English archer from Angicourt who ran amuck with a dagger in here, and a trooper of the Seventh Cavalry from the Custer Massacre. Gregory managed to overcome his revulsion. You see, we were forced to take on subjects largely at random, with regard to individual characteristics, mental attitudes, adaptability, etc. As long as he struck to high-order abstractions, he could control himself. Aside from their professional lack of repugnance for violence, we took soldiers from battlefields because we could select men facing immediate death, 
whose removal from the past would not have any effect upon the causal chain of events affecting the present. A warning buzzer rasped in Benson's brain. He nodded, poker-faced. I can see that, he agreed. You wouldn't dare do anything to change the past. That was always one of the favorite paradoxes in time travel fiction. Well, I think I have the general picture. You have a dictator who is tyrannizing you. You want to get rid of him. You can't kill him yourselves. I'm opposed to dictators myself. That, and the Selective Service Law, of course, was why I was a soldier. I have no moral or psychological taboos against killing dictators, or anybody else. Suppose I cooperate with you. What's in it for me?" There was a long silence. Walter and Carl looked at one another inquiringly. The others dithered helplessly. It was Carl who answered, "'You return to your own time and place.' "'And if I don't cooperate with you?' "'Guess when and where else we would send you,' Walter said. Benson dropped his cigarette and tramped it. "'Exactly the same time and place?' he asked. "'Well, the structure of space-time demands,' Paula began. "'The spatio-temporal displacement field is capable of identifying that spot,' Gregory pointed to a ten-foot circle in front of a bank of sleek cabineted dial-studded machines with any set of space-time coordinates in the universe. However, to avoid disruption of the structure of space-time, we must return you to approximately the same point in space-time." Benson nodded again, this time at the confirmation of his earlier suspicion. Well, while he was alive, he still had a chance. All right, tell me exactly what you want me to do. End of Chapter 2